Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. I left off my last episode with uh, moving eventually out of Sally and Rob's home and into a trailer with uh, Dee Dee and my two very little boys. And I wanted to take a moment, though, and remind everyone, remind us what it is that I'm hoping to do with this uh, kind of sharing. And my goal is to highlight a kind of transformation that can take place when you journey with other people. Whether you have a coach, a spiritual director, a uh, close Christian friend, or whether you're contemplating being that for someone else, that is a love is an action kind of uh, journey that you can go on with someone else. And the kind of love in action that the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ are ready to step into, hopefully. My other goal would be to encourage people to step into those kind of roles, because what happens is along the way, it makes you much more attentive to God, and you see people do things that are just not the norm today in many, many cases. And so that makes you step back and go, huh, wow, did I just see God with skin on help me? And so I wanted to share my story, my journey with you to show you and to to share with you the kinds of things that God sowed into my heart, which is part of why I am seeking to sow into the hearts, minds, and lives of, of those that God puts in my path as well. But when I left off, I think I said I moved in to the trailer it was a three-bedroom trailer with uh, two little boys, and Dee Dee was my roommate. Um, I could not afford to be on my own financially. I think that's a key component of the maid as I was watching that. There were times where graphics were up on the screen about how much she had in her pocket and, and what things were costing and how she's trying to figure this all out. And, and I kind of was that as well. At that point, I was on um, any government program I could get myself on. I was back in college on Pell Grants and that was a great thing. I went uh, right where I left off because I was a math major. So I was heading uh, towards towards engineering. I kept making the joke that I was going to drive a train. Um, I was on food stamps and suffered the, the shame and humiliation of, you know, trying to shop at off hours so that the crowds weren't there so that at that time, you, you know, had to rip off papers and stuff and whatever other assistance I could sustain. I couldn't afford to live on my own. Uh, the kind of assistance I got, which was the norm then, that's why it helped for me to have a roommate. That's where Dee Dee was really great about that. Our our landlord became affectionately referred to as Pepe Le Pew. He was of French descent and kind of talked you know, with an accent and uh, his name, I won't even share that, but it was not far, but sort of similar. And you know how you do that and whatever, but he was great. He was a great landlord to have. And I think we were pretty good renters besides. But what happened in the in that little trailer was, you know, a friendship with Dee Dee and I grew. I was always amazed at how she did her devotionals in the morning very regularly. I mean, like she didn't even get out of bed and grabbed her Bible. And I'm like, I don't know. That's just, I have to get up, get some coffee, something. But so I was always in awe of that. And I know she was in a place of struggle and, and then I was in a place of struggle. So we, you know, talked about stuff, you know, how women do that kind of thing. So on 
the refrigerator, though, in in our trailer was uh, refrigerator versus. Oh, I'm calling them refrigerator verses now. <laughs> but I guess you could say that. But I would change them up every now and then. But I would put Bible verses on the refrigerator and on the bathroom mirror. Jeremiah 29, 11 was one that I put on there for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. You get a future and a hope. And I was kind of waffling on the hope department from time to time. I'm just that kind of temperament that I have to go looking here, looking there sometimes to find to find it. And I have to really remind myself of that. And actually, that's a very appropriate verse. At one point, I think I was studying Jeremiah in seminary and thought, oh my gosh, are we just pulling that out of context and plopping it here and there? And it's really not. But as I really dug into that passage more, it was about when the Babylonians came in and carted all the, all the people off and they been plopped them down in an unknown and strange land, and it was as if you know all of life and the the rug that they were standing on had been pulled out from underneath them, and they didn't know which end was up or where. You know where do you go? Where's McDonald's around here? Where's Starbucks? You know, I it just was a very um, disorienting time, and so when Jeremiah offers these words, you know, I I grabbed onto that and just hung on to that, and still do, and still do. I think I said I moved into the um, trailer early December, but actually, even in late fall, there was a point where some unusual things happened to me. And I I was still at a place where I wasn't, you know, thinking all of my steps through thoroughly. I think my pastor had said to me, how do you eat an elephant one step at a time, one bite at a time? So I was doing one step at a time is what I was doing, just putting one foot in uh, in front of the other. And at that point, I was going to church on a regular basis. I had actually graduated and made it. I think I did Bible study for a year and a half before I ever set foot in a church service. I think I've shared that already, but just to remind you, and I was going on a regular basis and I was tithing on the government money I received. And as a pastor, I, I love to tell people that I think I was giving like $20. I don't know if it was $20 every week or $20 every other week. So when you did a, a any kind of a um, capital campaign or a, you know, a pledge drive or, or you're even just going to preach about money, <laughs> you can say, well, I knew this one pastor. And when she was on government assistance, she used to give $20 a week. I I think it was a week. So that's the giving level. And so I just kind of, that has impact maybe. I don't know. I never followed that kind of before I said it and after I said it comparison to the giving to see what kind of a challenge it was. But I was going to uh, church. Sally helped me with that transition. She said, come sit with us. You're going to sit with us, you know. And she was right there with me uh, all the time, helping me to feel comfortable in a very unknown and remote feeling place because, you know, they all spoke in this, what I came to understand later on is Zionese, you know. Uh, they're talking all about the blood and the redemption and all these big words. And I'm like, what does that mean? And I, I was literally um, relearning a, a whole different culture. And, and so I'm highly sensitive to that piece. I want to make sure people are not talking that Zionese, if at all possible. And I, I try not to myself, although I don't know, maybe I get hung up in it. I, Who knows after a while, right? So I do recall, um, I think it was really late fall, right before I moved into the trailer, that um, a couple of of funny things started happening. And, you know, the first time I just thought it was a little amusing. I was riding in um, a truck because Sally drove a truck. One day she drove a truck because she carted and hauled dirt and things for people. And I said, "Um, you know what I feel like? And she said, no, what? I said, I feel like an ice cream cone. And she, she laughed. I mean, meanwhile, I'm doing the mental gymnastics of, you know, do I have the money for that kind of thing? Um, And she says, I happen to have a coupon for a buy one, get one free ice cream cone. Let's right in my pocket. I just got it the other day. Let's go. So I kind of was amused by that because it was sort of like, okay, that, coupon was in her pocket before I even asked 
about an ice cream cone. So that was the first time. After I moved in, though, um, there was a, a knock on the door oh, a couple weeks before Christmas, I think. And I opened the door and all I could see is this big green, evergreen tree thing. And then out pops from behind it is, um, you know, Sally and Rob. And they had cut a tree down off of their property and brought a tree in and a stand. And I can't remember how we decorated it, but I'm sure we, we did something. Uh, but um, I, gee, you know, it was details like that that I really wasn't thinking about real clearly. I mean, and I'm pretty planning oriented. I'm pretty, um, I can sequence things and organize things and, and, and processes and all of that. But at that particular time, I don't think I even considered where's a Christmas tree going to come from, but they showed up at my house with that. So I, I laughed about that. And maybe a few days before Christmas, there was another knock on the door. And Carrie, this was someone I had met through church, brought in this lavishly wrapped gift. I mean, I know there are people out there that do Christmas wrapping paper to the nines, you know. And I'm just not one of those people. I, I wrap it and I do a very neat and tidy job for the most part. But then I'm not about the bows and the... What do you, I don't even know what you call that, netting stuff and ribbons and all of this. But this was absolutely the most lavish job of wrapping I had, I could remember seeing for, you know, a long time. And uh, it was just stunning. And I don't even, I can't even tell you what was in the box <laughs> right now. I really, I just, that dawned on me a minute ago. I was like, I don't even know what was in the box. But um, it was beautiful. And it just... It just made me feel special in that moment, you know, and it didn't even matter what was in the box, apparently, but someone had reached out and she brought it over and said, I want you to put, I want this under your tree and don't open it till Christmas and, you know, on and on. It was gorgeous. The next time um, that I felt like I, I had this funny encounter happen was I was thinking about how I needed to get a calendar and something on the wall that I could kind of envision uh, the month for me. You have to remember, this was before, are you ready for this? The internet. This was before, which is also before, you know, cell phones. And which is, is kind of funny because I am by nature somebody that is, um, as the Myers-Briggs people would say, you know, I'm uh, a J person to the core. So I needed, I wanted a calendar and I never said anything to anyone. And then um, the postman brought this package for me and I opened it and there was a wall calendar on there. It was um, a really decorative thing that my mother had sent me and I never said anything to anyone. And I came to look at all of the, it was just like a little cascade of people just doing little things that really touched me and really was a reminder to me of, of what Philippians 4.19 says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And, and sometimes, you know, you need to see the love of God inhabit another human being. Um, it's those actions of love, actions of love through other people who have responded to the urgings of God to do this for me. And I just don't think we do this enough. I think we maybe think these things. Someone ought to, how many times do you hear that? Maybe at church or at home or somebody ought to, maybe that somebody ought to be you to do that and to step into whatever it is that God is is nudging your heart. Sometimes those little, that's what it says the voice of God is, is that still small voice. Why don't you give gift wrap something beautifully and give it to Margie? She really might love to have something under her tree that looks like that. You know, we tend to just shove that aside sometimes or we get busy. I'll get busy. I'll get distracted and I'll think, oh yeah, I meant to to do that and I never got to it. I can't tell you how many times that that happens, but more than ever before, I think in this day, place, and time, we need to 
step into these actions of love. Um, whether you're going to buy the next person in lines coffee or whatever it is that God is telling you to do, because it it was for me in those moments a way of God saying to me, "I see you. I know what's going on, and I care." So we need to be those people one for another. But there really, there really was one more person that gave me a gift, and and I'll share that with you in just a moment. But I want to um, just remind us that you really do need to be journeying with other people, and sometimes that's harder than others. And I know it's been challenging through COVID. Um, we do have Zoom. And sometimes, you know, you have a Zoom appointment that you know you should keep and you just don't feel like it. You just don't feel like you're the best company for other people. I did have a friend that would, you know, do that kind of thing. You know, I'd say, we haven't seen you in a while. She was, I know when I'm really in a bad place, I just, I just hide. And I'm like, well, don't do that. Or I had another friend that you could always gauge how she was. (laughs) You could say, how are you doing today? And she'd say, fine. If it was really high pitched, you knew she wasn't really fine, you know, that kind of thing. So you need to, even if you don't feel like it in the moment, it is so important that we connect with other people so that we can journey together, so that we can be be Jesus for one another, the world, whether whether it's Christians, non-Christians, the world needs to see that. We, we got to stop being dim bulbs and start being bright, bright, shining lights and, and people that you know, you can you can count on it. It doesn't mean everybody has to be Susie Sunshine because I would bomb out on that on a regular basis. I am just not Susie Sunshine. But there are ways, places, times where I can just be kind, you know, just be kind. So that's enough. That's a mini rant. I have other rants coming in our next uh, episode, but I wanted to share with you the one last person who gave me just a tremendous, tremendous gift. And that was, again, the pastor. This is the pastor that, you know, knew what I was going through and the pastor that helped me find a safe place. And I have to tell you, this, this is in my more than 30 years, 40, whatever, of going to church, this was the only time I heard a pastor from the pulpit say these words, who here wants to be a disciple of Jesus? And I'll say more about that in the next episode. Hey, thanks for listening. It is my deep desire and passion to champion issues of sustainability in ministry and for your life. So I'm here to help. I stepped back from pastoral ministry and I feel called to help ministry leaders uh, create and cultivate sustainability in their lives so that they can go the distance with God and whatever plans that God has for you. I would love to help. I would consider it an honor. And in all things, make sure you connect to these sustainability practices, you know, so that you don't become the crabby pastor.